Elaine Miller loves to challenge your pelvic floor. I'm a fanny physio. I didn't know that fanny physio was a thing either. It's well documented that laughter promotes learning. I know a fish about the fannies of faith. <laughs> which is just as well really, because it made justifying the trip to Edinburgh Fringe Festival that much easier. And when pissing yourself laughing is both the goal and the subject matter, it certainly wasn't going to be a quiet one. Right, you know, you know when you sit in a chair, like a plastic chair, and you sit down and you're there for a wee while and you get up and you go, oh my god, there's a wee wet triangle. <laughs> and you think you just pissed yourself off. She's leading the way in promoting a greater understanding of women's pelvic health, but through rather non-traditional means. The BBC might have got to see Elaine in the clinic, but we decided we wanted to see her on the stage and join her as she took her message to the streets of Edinburgh. are very hot, they're warm and cosy. That's why people like <laughs> sticking bits themselves in there. It's nice. <laughs> so they're warm enough to set up a wee weather system <laughs> in this space and you get condensation. Binge mist. <laughs> I think that most people that land up doing women's health either have experienced themselves of problems or somebody that they know and love has. There's a reason that people get pulled into it um, and why they stick in it. I wrote this show in a fit of temper because I wrote a government thing that said that 50% of women in Britain didn't know the difference between their vulva and their vagina. And I thought, well, that's not very good, is it? Oh, it's up there and the vagina's down in there. No? Vulva's up top. The clitoris. What, the clitoris is the vulva? Yeah. No. No. I'm impressed. I know my way around. <laughs> well done. Yes! Yeah! That's very impressive. Well done, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never wearing a vulva. Aye. She is talking about things that we're not taught as women, and we're not taught about, and we're not taught the language. You know, like when she says so many women don't know the difference between, you know, their vulva and their vagina, that's because we're never given words for it. And why do you think that is? Because they're women's bits, they're not important. There must have been a moment, or at least a phase, where you got a bit between your teeth to sh spread this message beyond the walls of that department or that community, or uh, when did it kind of go national, then international? I realised that nobody was doing it and I couldn't believe it. If, we've, if we're doing no outreach, if we're not telling, women that physio exists for these problems and that most of them are manageable, if not curable, I think that's misogyny. I think it's not okay. We're making women suffer and it has lifelong implications for them. Having to balance comedy with being a physio, right? Because those things, of course, now, they do go hand in hand because you've made them go hand in hand, but it's not a natural fit. So when did that happen? Um, well, again, it wasn't planned. I just did it and then got some feedback from some of my professional peers that they weren't that keen because they thought that it was fundamentally unprofessional was what I was told many times, sometimes at quite loud volume right in my face. And um, I said that I didn't mind. I didn't mind that they thought it was unprofessional because I thought that there was a role for doing outreach and nobody else was doing it. So I designed my own flag and my own identity and I'm ho hoping that you might join it. This is to represent the NPH tribe. This is for heterosexual women who have been with the same man for quite a long time. <laughs> the black stripe represents all the women who have been with the same man and he's a good man and he's doing his best. 
slightly disappointing man for about 20 slightly disappointing years and she's been having the same slightly disappointing sex for slightly disappointing 20 minutes at a time and eventually she thinks oh mate you're all right it's not worth the urinary tract infection and she stops having sex she becomes a non-practicing heterosexual and NPH who's in? Has Elaine's message made a difference? Of course it's made a huge so difference, how? saved my sex life. It's changed everything. Amazing, <laughs> really. So that simple consultation that took you seriously yes. and, and it made it individualized, that yes. made a difference. Also, I could tell her about my two extreme births I had with high forceps. I had to have the mesh procedure afterwards because I was nearly incontinent after Same. my two kids and having breast cancer. Most doctors were like, no, no, too complicated. You know, you're lucky to be alive. You're a 50 year old woman and you're having sex. Good for you. That's, they couldn't care less. And it's like, well, no, I'm not getting as much as I wanted to. And it's not as good as it, and it's more painful. And I want, I, it should be better. Absolutely. What? And talking to Lane, it was like, no, this isn't normal. And there are right. options for you. And right. there are things you can do. And she and cared. Then, she cared. And she was funny. <laughs> Strike represents the heterosexual women who aren't quite there yet because sometimes he has a birthday or it's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks really sad. <laughs> and you think, well, it's been a while, right? <laughs> and you just do it. Yeah. Title like that at the fringe show is utterly irresistible. <laughs> Um, and, you know, what I got from it is, is the inf information that I might have needed, although I knew quite a lot already. Okay. And um, that beautiful combination of entertaining and informing that the BBC is supposed to fulfil but has long lost sight of. I love the show. I, I don't know if I articulated this to Elaine, but I think that her show on a school's tour, never mind, never mind you know, ordinary yeah, venues, yeah. on a school's tour for young women, would just do so much to ad advance not only, you know, better health for young women, but also more openness. Because uh, much of the time, you know, even if it's going into surgery or, you know, dealing with medical issues, it's 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 not so much taboo as, as personal embarrassment that often stops yeah. people talking. The stripe at the bottom is vanilla, and that is so that I can reclaim vanilla sex. And um, so vanilla sex, if you're not sure, is the sort of traditional heterosexual sex with the man on top, leaning on his elbows, utilising his superior upper body strength, like nature intended, and like a gentleman. And um, occasionally you might, you know, flick things around a bit, you might put the woman on top, like a garnish. <laughs> I want to reclaim vanilla sex. Sex does not necessarily need to require a safety word and a first aid kit. And an audience. Vanilla is the best flavour, everybody knows that. Um, I think that heterosexual women and heterosexual relationships deserve an awful lot of more respect than we get because we are the evidence that sexuality is innate because we keep shagging our only known predator. <laughs> do you think it's important do, that you might not know? Is it, is it a trivial difference between a vagina and a vulva, do you think? Does it no, matter? I think it's actually good that somebody would educate you on it. No, no, am I on my own here? No. Would you, would, you, would you rather know? Yeah. Yeah? Why would it be useful to know? Well, because if you knew that something was wrong and you knew where it was, you would know how to fix it. But if somebody didn't tell you, you're completely clueless. No? The study wasn't that great, though, because it didn't have a comparator. It didn't get the men and say to them, can you tell the difference between a penis and a testicle? And I don't have any... <laughs> I don't have any right to say this because there isn't any data, but I reckon 100% of guys can do that. <laughs> if you saw yourself in the mirror, would you know what was normal and what was abnormal? The study also didn't find out whether women knew the difference between a penis and a testicle, and I'm sure that even women who have nothing to do with penises at all because they don't like them are fairly confident in telling the difference between the two. Well, I would hope so. Can we just unpick what was it about that professionally that they were, you know, were they, were they implying that the evidence is such that, uh, or, or that you, you had a, either a misreading or an oversimplification of the evidence, or was it more just this, did they even try and masquerade like that? Because we all know that they were just saying it's crass, it's vulgar, it's, 
it's not the done thing and therefore that's not professional because we've got this narrow sense of professionalism. And but they hadn't seen it, it. Right, okay. So it's more that they were just taking a guess because you were using naughty words? Yeah. Or what? Well, 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 I, don't, it... I don't know because I haven't been told officially but that was the conclusion that I came to eventually. Did they ever sort of suggest or claim then that you were off on the evidence base or there was an inaccuracy to it or something? Um, I did get some inquiries about where I got my data from because what I was quoting was sometimes different from what they had on their teaching courses. Yeah. So they wanted to know, which was fine. Yeah. And I thought at the time we have one school that's training physios in this specialism that I think is really important. And you're all getting the same information. And I like people that have come from a variety of backgrounds because that's how you get diversity. So to be respectful, these people had spent a lot of time analysing the data and the research and they come up with best practice, which it is for the one woman that's consenting in front of me. But there's 13 million of them. So how's that going to work? Was there a moment or a time where you then took a jump and that became the majority of what you were doing and spending time thinking about relative to either clinical work or the more traditional roots of playing a physio career? A civil I started to get a bit political about it because I thought this just needs funding and nobody's going to do it, nobody's going to get the money. So I pulled together data and presented it at Holyrood. I was presenting, I dressed as a fanny in Parliament, it was really good, um, but they had the press there and nobody said a headline, fanny in Parliament, which was gutted about us. Nobody said pish spoken in Parliament, no good. Um, but it doesn't take that much to get the attention of these people, because a lot of them really do care about what's in their, in their inbox. Um, it's just that very few of us engage with them. So it wasn't that hard to yeah. say, I can save you billions of pounds. What politician isn't going to be interested in that? Yeah. So then that meant I landed up speaking to civil service. That's, that's political clickbait if ever there was some, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. so then that got you some traction. And the civil servant suggested that I should be treating populations instead of individuals because I'm a good communicator. And I thought, hmm, yeah. that's a good point because ultimately nobody cares about women's health. If they did, they would have funded it. They haven't. They're not going to. We've now got the tail end of a pandemic. We're going to have a recession. We've got political chaos. Nobody is going to fund it. 80% of pain medication has only ever been researched on men, which is interesting because women's brains have got a different number of opioid receptors in them. So sometimes we need a different dose to get the same analgesic effect. And this is influenced by our menstrual cycle and whether we're pre or post menopause. But some work done in mice found that women sometimes need twice as much, female mice need twice as much morphine to manage the pain as male mice, but we don't know about human beings. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, ten years ago, there was an amazing drug was discovered that killed severe menstrual pain dead. So endometriosis pain, you take this one new tablet and it has no side effects. How wonderful, a decade ago. It's not been researched into using it for that because it's called sildenafil and its trade name is Viagra. It does something important, ladies. Yeah, isn't that shocking? Honestly, it'll get funny again in a minute. Um, so <laughs> Have you ever heard it, the clip was called the DJ bit before? DJ. Amazing. That's a new one. If you're a healthcare professional, because this show is evidence-based, it counts as CPD, and very soon <laughs> on our website you'll be able to get all the references, because nothing I've said has, can't be backed up by a reference, I'm not an idiot. And um, I can give you a list of reflective practice questions and a certificate of attendance. <laughs> So our own show discusses female-specific anatomy. She historically encountered accusations of being vulgar and unprofessional, but comfortably won that argument with evidence of her effectiveness in promoting public health. And um, this show, I was told, is fast on track to becoming the most loathed show of the fringe. But these days, she's encountering a new taboo, transphobia. When it comes to this topic, the socio-political factors often steal headlines, with toilets, refuges, prisons and sports being areas that most people have thoughts on. But here at Physio Matters, we're evidence-informed, research literate healthcare professionals. So let's focus on the health issues here. How has due scientific process been subverted on this? So, I am not afraid of saying that sex matters. And that doesn't mean that gender doesn't, but sex does matter. I am a woman, I want to be called a woman, and I want my sex-based rights. Now, 
If you think that what I've just said is not worthy of respect in a democratic society, you've got some options. Number one, you could come and talk to me. That would be great, because believe me, I want to be wrong on this stuff. It does keep me awake at night. If you don't want to do that, you can report me to my governing body, the HCPC. 101 is also the number that you could use to phone the police if you think that I'm committing a hate crime. <laughs> the charge you want to get me on is malicious communications, which carries a penalty of three years, but the hate crime element adds seven years. <laughs> now, they're not going to give me ten years in jail. I'm adorable. Um, they might give me five, which means I would serve three, which means I get to spend three years in the company of society's most vulnerable women and I will fix all their fannies and I will have a PhD. Yes. Uh, what did you think? Marvellous. Yeah? yeah very um, entertaining but also extremely um, good uh, because at 73 I've learned something. I really? I think because she's she's basing it on facts and she's basing it on mm, science. Right. Uh, although there's very little science about the female anatomy, but <laughs> but there is it is about that. And yeah. I think it, the more that we're informed about our body and how it works and how it shouldn't work and, mm. and all of that, then the, the best that we can be. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. and I work with young women and the more that they can be involved, because otherwise what they think is what they've got isn't normal, whereas right. it is normal. Yeah. It is normal to have skin there, it is normal to feel like that. Mm. It is good to, to pleasure yourself and stuff like that. That's really important, mm. you know? Um, and I think that in this day and age, we, move, we need more of that, more honesty and education. So what would you say, there's some people, even in our profession, that feel that it's a bit unprofessional to discuss things in these manners. What would you say to that? But that's about themselves. That's not about the people that they're educating. Right. You know, that's about them. I mean, that's their own dysfunction with how they feel. Right. You know, it's nothing to do with, um, like, what the, the general public might feel. Mm. You know, you have to give people the opportunity. So Elaine is someone who is so well known in physiotherapy, and I initially reached out to her following her drive-by Christmas campaign that she did on Instagram about trying to get women more knowledgeable and engaged in their pelvic floor muscle training. So the use of humour is contentious in professional circles for some, but obviously it cuts through as well and it becomes entertaining. What's your sort of take on that just generally? Because you have your hand in sort of two camps there, you've, as an academic, but also then clinically knowing how important this subject matter is. It's a really good question. And from a clinical practice point of view, it's really important to um, retain professionalism and be professional, especially with quite sensitive topics. But what we've seen tonight with Elaine show, Aviva Your Vulva, is that in women's health taboo topics, it creates this platform for conversation and safety and unity. Uh, that nervous laughing, that acceptance that you're not alone with these sorts of symptoms is so important. And there's lots of different types of humour that Elaine knows so much more than me, but you know, sarcasm, irony, there must be a place for the right type of humour potentially in healthcare. It was really good, it was really funny, it was informative, um, and I think it was great. What about that as a style of education as well as entertainment? Like, do you think that's a good angle? I think it would encourage more people to engage with that sort of information um, when it's funnier. What, what would you say to people that consider introducing humour to stuff like that? Because sometimes it can, can be a bit prim and proper in healthcare sometimes, isn't it? Because yeah. it is serious business, yeah. but does everything have to be serious? You clearly think not, perhaps? No, I, I think for some people that's their style and that's what works for them. And I understand that um, when you bring humour into things, maybe sometimes people think we're taking it less seriously. Right. But it's also some ways people love engaging with the education or engaging with the content that's in it. So I don't think it's harmful for people who that's how they're going to learn how to do it. I, but I do see people's point of view, I guess some of the language maybe that's used in the show, um, some people wouldn't agree with, but I think it helps engage a wider audience. No, fast play. How'd it go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you should answer that. No. Um, I'm... I've been writing a scathing furious oh, review. Oh, thank God. You, as you'd say, but no. How do you feel it was? Um, I'm relieved because I thought it was fine. I thought that it was, um, it wasn't stuttery and it was okay. I was really tired and if I'm really, really tired, sometimes I get a bit stuck, but I think it was funny enough. Is that because we'd knackered you through the day? Yeah. <laughs> he had me up Arthur's seat. Yeah. <laughs> That's an actual place, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I get it. Um, well, yeah. I can answer. It, it, was, it was brilliant. What is it about this subject matter that you think is so polarising? 
right now? Like, why? Speaking frankly, because bodies like Stonewall have successfully gaslit people into accepting what they say and not arguing against it. People are really scared of being accused of being transphobic because nobody wants to be accused of being hateful about anything. And I don't think that what I'm saying is hateful. And interestingly, a few nights ago, there was a woman came, because I say to them, if you don't like what I'm saying, if you think that what I'm saying is not worthy of respect in a democratic society, which is a direct reference to the finding of a court case, that if you follow these issues, you know what that means. It's short for warriads, and it means that I am protected. What I'm saying is protected in law. Are you just talking about... You're talking about female genitalia, right? There's some facts of the matter, there's some raw biology, so I find that to be a bit... But what she said, this woman that came to talk to me afterwards, said, sorry to interrupt you off, no, no. she said um, she'd never heard anybody counter the hashtag be kind stuff without being hateful. So I had challenged what she was thinking, because clearly in her opinion I was compassionate and I knew my stuff and I have practical clinical experience with this community and I'm not hateful but I also don't think that it's reasonable to say that trans women are exactly the same as me because I have seen the harm that that does to the trans women and also to the women. I don't think it's okay. So we had a really interesting conversation because she was expecting to be able to say well what about this and she was a bit floored that I'm not hateful. But you'll be thankful that she came and talked to you Very. It. It's a brave thing to do. In the main, there's only really two categories in the physio field, at least. One is those that are actively buying wholesale gender ideology. And the other category is those that are keeping their heads down. Those people, there, there are people that are in touch with me who are not uninformed, who understand the problems, who are worried about the problems, or the, the, by problem I mean the, the sort of silence and the collusion. They've been impacted on it by themselves or within their family. But they're anxious about speaking up because our governing body have made a statement yesterday that if you say that you don't believe that trans women are women, they're gonna they're gonna silence you. So if you're relying on a mortgage, like if you need your job in order to pay your mortgage, are you really gonna take this on? Because it's complex. So you can be uncomfortable with a situation, but that's a whole different matter from having enough insight, understanding the complexity of the law, the, the complexity of the science, and the community themselves, who are vulnerable. Do you think a third category will emerge of people that then end up feeling like something has moved, and if so, what would move them to speak up? Because because the only thing one way we can make progress on it is if yeah. people did, and we understand why they're not. But what moves them to do so? I think it is happening. I think people are pretty horrified. And I don't use that word lightly with what the conversation is in ICSP. Are you serious in saying that those consequences, as bizarre as it must be to even consider it, are worthwhile, and that this is the hill that you will be willing to die on? I do a very good job of curating a, an appearance of being a bit of a muppet. But yes, I'm deadly serious. This is not stuff to dabble in. At the moment, we are losing, female people are losing our rights. So my daughter has fewer rights in law than I had when I was her age. And I'm not having it. So. Although it's a silly setup because it's a fringe show and it's funny and it's ha 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 ha, the point of it is deadly serious. I am not having my daughter having fewer rights than I have because my daughter is okay because she's articulate and she's able to advocate for herself and she comes from a family that's supportive. But not every woman has that benefit. And these women who think that they are willing to give up the rights in order to accommodate somebody else's needs, I understand it. But they're forgetting about the women that need those rights. They rely on them. I'll stick to healthcare for now. How might we move past this? We need to surely stick with the evidence, stick with the facts, and, and just keep making our arguments. 
but not be naive to the politics. Like, what, just give me, give me a clue as to how we can, just on healthcare, not on the sort of wider social thing. We're not sticking to the evidence, we're not sticking to the facts. We've gone down a, a direction that is, to my mind, completely counter to science and what your own eyes tell you. We're not, we're way past that point. I think that it's going to take 10 years to unpick it. Really? That yeah, long? yeah. Because we've taught people that, that are at a, a, a developmental stage that you can change sex. So I know, because I work for these people, I have a family in Edinburgh that kids was, you know, believed themselves to have a gender difference and had started down a route of transition and then COVID happened. So there was two years of no input at all. And the kid is devastated because they've realized that in fact, they are a kid that's same sex attracted. They were never transgender. And everybody lied is what that child's impression is. And they are now really very unwell because all the people, their teachers, their, their, their uniformed association, their family, supported something that wasn't actually properly explored. And I, I, can't, I can't be part of that. These, there, is, there are people that have got a gender difference that benefit from transitioning, but when I was in Finland for a conference, I went and met with um, the psychiatrist in Finland that does the paediatric. Every child that transitions goes through her um, door. She's amazing. And I just cold emailed her and said, look, I'm in town, if you've got time for a coffee, I've got some questions about this. And she says that the spike of referrals that we've seen here doesn't happen in Finland because the language is different and they don't have pronouns. So it's just very different. So if that's happening, what's causing it here? And you're not allowed to ask that question because that is apparently a transphobic question. I think if there was a 5,000% spike in kids presenting with diabetes, we would have a government inquiry. Why is gender so special and so different? I dispute that it's special, I dispute that it's different, I think it's another health issue that just needs to be researched and we get best evidence and we approach with it. What this psychiatrist said was, you, d you don't do puberty blockers, that's why they've been removed now, um, we don't do surgery, we watch and wait because 80% of these kids turn out to be homosexual kids. So stop cutting corners. So you're doing gay conversion therapy? What? But then the people that are driving the information have got 11 and a half million pounds of funding this year. Stonewall have got 11 and a half million pounds. So the people with the evidence base that I'm working with, they can't compete against that. It's compete for the, for the airwaves. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's, that's sort of... So sort somebody of needs to but speak we've got to keep, up. We've got to speak up, we've got to, you know, make the arguments, but speaking convince up people. Puts you at risk of being criticised and puts you at risk of losing your job and being harassed in the street and I don't care because I don't care something needs to change so I'll do it because I'm quite protected because I do have a fellowship yeah. and I am quite senior in my role Some independence. and I'm willing to be disciplined I'm willing to defend myself in a tribunal I'm willing to defend myself in court I'm willing to go to jail if what I am actually saying is is in fact transphobic if that's what a jury of my peers decided fair enough I'll suck it up I thought I was right maybe I was wrong give me some time to reflect on it that's fine and that's why I am winding people up because I'm supposed to be ashamed. I'm not. You're, you, you're meant to have backtracked by now. Yeah, I'm not backtracking because I've looked at this for a long time and I am confident in my interpretation of the data. And they should argue their case. Yeah. They should debate. They should say, well, we have this data that says, or we have this person that says, and they're not doing that. They're just saying, you're a terrible, hateful person. I'm not an adorable. <laughs> yeah, charming, honest. Elaine's Fringe show is critically acclaimed because it's everything comedy should be. Innovative, brave, personal, challenging, and of course, bloody funny. But the impact of her work, like persuading her colleagues to consider menopausal factors affecting pain, and convincing vulnerable women to get their leaky fannies fixed so they can exercise again, is being overshadowed by unsubstantiated accusations of bigotry and an increasingly censorious culture that doesn't want shows like hers watched or women like her heard. But having spent some time with her at the height of the abuse she was receiving, I can confidently tell her haters, good luck with that. <laughs>